have some questions. There's five different questions um, that I'll be asking. And I'm going to apologize in advance that if I cut you off, that's because we've got to keep this thing rolling and moving. And you don't feel pressure that you have to answer every one of these questions, Jeff. <laughs> you can answer them, or you don't have to, or you can answer a different one. But let's, you know, we'll stick to the subject. So let's start here with Meryl. Thank you. <laughs> Rhymes with Cheryl and Meryl yeah. Lynch. And okay, you got three sentences. <laughs> three sentences. I prefer to use wind and light, not just visibly, but poetically. I use form the way a painter uses color, expressively. Content or meaning comes first and orchestrates the technology. Wonderful. Rain. Nice. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, Rain Treefelt. I'm a solar kinetic artist, and uh, I believe that uh, solar kinetic sculpture could one day uh, power your arboretum, could power your community, um, it could power your municipality or a, or a building, and uh, be beautiful at the same time. Thank you. I'm Tom Bruitz. I've been um, Sculpting for a number of years since I was even a kid a little bit uh, playing around but the thing that I really like to do is is have the environment express itself and use my sculpture uh, to do that with uh, gravity and wind gravity and wind are kind of at battle with one another with my work and um, that part of it I really enjoy, and the entertainment value for the viewer. Okay. I'm John King. I live in Colorado on a river, and uh, I'm very interested in the way living things are moved by the air and the water that is passing us by. Evan Lewis, uh, been in the Midwest a long time. Um, have always been interested in kinetic art that is wind powered uh, because the power source is random and so I've always strived to create things that um, are unexpected, do unexpected things. Uh, also now I'm very keen on introducing sound into these things so that uh, I can sort of create an experience that some time that's meditative and hopefully very positive and inspiring. Uh, Jeffrey Lautenschlager. Um, that sentence one. <laughs> um, I, I, I like my work to be uh, meditative, contemplative, and a bit more like uh, Tai Chi than rapidly moving uh, things. Um, two sentences is enough. Yeah, <laughs> right. My name is Jeff Kahn. I try to make very simple looking, magically moving kinetic sculptures that appeal to people and maybe inspire a little and relax and last a long time. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that was really good. Wow. <laughs> um, so the first question is, what inspired you to create kinetic art? So who wants to start? Anybody? I'll start. Yeah, go. I started making computer-operated sculptures when computers were big in the, well, beginning to be big in the late 70s and 80s. And with the help of a genius friend of mine was making computers that could operate up to 5,000 LEDs, mm. required an intensive amount of wiring and little chips and timers. Uh, and then I was in a flea market and I saw one of those little acrobats, which I learned maybe like Calder, that balances on a pedestal with the poles and the little balls at the end. And I thought, I wonder how many of those I can stack up and make balance. 
<laughs> and I went back to my shop and just got addicted to making non-electric sculpture and uh, haven't stopped yet. Excellent. Anybody else? I'll go, if you don't mind, a couple of cues from some notes. As a young artist, I enjoyed painting and drawing outdoors. I tried to capture the wind. I tried to capture the movement of light in my paintings. And I realized the intangible forces as well as how light changes when you're trying to capture it on a static sheet of paper or canvas. It led me to, ins uh, to becoming an abstract painter. And I used the lines of movement to enable me to make collages that were abstract, echoing water motion or wind movement, as well as I used actual pouring of water to create shapes. It wasn't until in 1984 when the state of New Jersey invited me to consider an idea for an atrium that I thought of making a painting in air. I thought of tossing my shapes up and allowing them to transport the natural light from inside, outside the building into the inside of the building. What happened was I thought after working three years on this project, light dance, I thought I was activating the space with moving shapes. I met a mechanical engineer three years later and he said, first of all, the only reason your pieces are moving and they were out of colored lucite was they were on very long wires, aircraft cables that were winding and unwinding. And so I got lucky with mm -hmm. that Kinetic project. Kinetic project, right. and he said, bring me your shapes, mm -hmm. and I'll show you how to make them fly. Nice. So I did. Anybody else? Oh, uh, well. So uh, I've been doing kinetic art since undergraduate school. My first uh, sculptures included fire as an element, which moved. And so my uh, undergraduate thesis was all about um, flaming sculptures. Um, in graduate school, um, I kind of took the grease ball mechanical background of fixing cars and things like that and started making uh, sculptures that um, uh, human bodies that floated in the air seemingly but had a refrigeration system inside of it. So like a cooler, it would sweat on the outside. Um, the flyer that is coming to uh, the Arboretum later is, uh, this will be the 30th anniversary of this flyer, and that was also um, inspired in my graduate thesis. Um, so, you know, I've been doing kinetic arts in school, and, and that's a long time. And uh, I've just been growing, so that's the start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to add something. Um, Tom Bruitt's here. As a child, and uh, I think it may have been in junior high, uh, it was Halloween was kind of a fun thing at our house because we we lived on a hill higher than just about every house on the on the block, and uh, the kids would be uh, afraid to come up there. My dad had some spooky music on and stuff, and <laughs> we had this big porch with a lot of uh, windows, and I had come up with this idea to take like these skeletons which were black light sensitive and uh, combine it with one of my dad's motors. He was a kind of an inventor at 3M up in Minnesota. And um, I, I made these, these uh, figures come up to the window and then back off. And it was, you know, I was, I guess, my first kinetic piece of art, which has <laughs> nothing to do with the ones I create now. But I just thought I'd mention that. And when I mentioned that I was a kinetic artist maybe as a child, well, that could have been my first piece. But I have no longer have that piece. So anyway, thanks. Well, excellent. That's a great story. So I'm going to move on to the next question. If you want to include you know, some of your answers in the next one, that's great. So yeah. Is it possible we could, we could cease the clapping in between? 
Yeah, that would be a good idea. <laughs> Very good. So explain how STEAM, or science, technology, engineering, art, and math, principles, how do they play a role in creating your kinetic art? <laughs> well, what, what ends up happening when you, when you start to uh, uh, create a piece of kinetic art um, in a public situation is um, there's a great deal of planning that goes into the sculpture before you even make a cut or, or cast any pieces. Um, so the, the first area that you would go into is into the design phase. And then after the design phase, you go into an engineering phase, which as I indicated earlier, uh, my project was a year and a half in engineering. After Irma, um, people got nervous and, and then you know there was four months more of additional engineering involved. Um, so basically, everything is so well thought out um, that, that before you even, even make a cut, um, uh, the, the engineering is, 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 you know, you know what you're going to do in advance, um, right down to the last nut and bolt. And then the technology comes involved where, uh, you know, some of it's, it's casting, lost wax casting, some of the pieces are laser cut, and so all these are, you know, require CAD drawings and things like that in order to get them done. And, uh, you know, that, it's a, a little bit more involved in that, right. but that's basically... Thank uh, you. I know, Jeffrey, you do a lot of um, these STEAM principles for your work and others. Sure. I, I don't know if they're new principles, but um, uh, doing kinetic art uh, certainly forced me to learn how to work a computer. And uh, uh, I selected a, a program called SolidWorks. And the SolidWorks is a, is a, is a very, very good um, assistant. You know, it's, it's an engineer. It's a design component. It's got a small amount of art. It makes animations. And then uh, once I'm satisfied, then I can send this information to um, a company that has a water jet. Uh, they cut all the parts out more accurately than I ever could independently. And, um, and then I have an assistant that picks up the parts, takes it to his studio, and puts it all together. So I, I, I guess what technology has done for me is taken me out of the picture, except for having fun. <laughs> My ideas can happen at any time. I think that's part of what you do when you're an artist. You're aware of what's going on in any moment of the day, uh, any time of the year, mm -hmm. just like kinetics. Uh, even in the middle of the night, you could get an idea like I did once in a dream. In working on a public commission, it's at that point when you have your idea and it's like, how's this going to happen? How do I blend the artistic vision with the technical? And that is a real achievement because for me, I want it to look like it just happened. So for example, in a recent work and um, working with Wayne LaPierre, some of you have met, a very, very skilled fabricator and a bit of an engineer. We had to have, in a current work, an engineering study done on stability to make sure that the piece would stand up even though it looks like it's falling over hmm. and endure. Okay, I have a, a favor. I'm gonna have the mic handed over to Jeff Kahn. And I want him to tell a story about how he met, meets his 150, 100, and whatever mile an hour wind. Oh. <laughs> this is a great story. You'll love it. <laughs> well, I have all these people like Debbie saying, is it going to stand up? And I wanted to test some of my pieces. And I called around and found that it cost about $10,000 a day to rent a wind tunnel so you can put your sculpture in it. And, and get some information on it. So I decided I couldn't afford that, so I built a rig for the back of my truck and assembled my sculpture on it. <laughs> Drove it down a country road at 90 miles an hour, which is all the truck would do, and videoed it with my GoPro camera. 
The videos are on YouTube, and it, it held up perfectly. I used my weakest components, <laughs> and I was surprised at the results. <laughs> so uh, technology's okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> How about, um, Evan, you had an interesting story about the new piece that you're creating, and there's a lot of technological work that goes into that, even though it's... Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I'm not sure. Um, I guess I would have to say that uh, in my own experience, um, it's just so much trial and error and intuition. And so um, I believe that um, a certain of us, probably everybody here certainly, uh, that we are wired in a way that enables us to sort of just figure these things out, um, which is how I've always done it. Um, so there's a lot of physics involved, uh, but the discoveries, I make all the discoveries just by making the thing and then seeing what it will do. Um, so it's very tactile and based on trying and then trying again and again. Particularly with the bells, uh, because making bells is a whole other um, sort of thing uh, the science. And so that there's just a ton of trial and error involved there, and you know, you just I just hope for the best and see where I can get. Great, thank you. All right, let's go to the next question. How does kinetic art influences new new technologies? How do you think what you're doing, and what you see in the future, you know, how do you think that your impact of what you're working on today will affect um, long-term kinetics, and where it's, where do you think it's going to go? <laughs> well, I was thinking earlier as, uh, you know, robotics and, and uh, artificial intelligence uh, progress, it, it could be interesting to, to see uh, what a robot or a, or a computer could come up with in kinetic art. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that, that that's definitely a possibility and it could be pretty interesting. Okay, Tom, did you have something? Yeah, I, I have always envisioned, uh, I use mostly like a, a, a hoop shape, either a square or circle, uh, exploit those squares and circles and triangles <laughs> as much as possible. But I always envisioned that I could have a sculpture that would actually, you know, crank something, you know, as it's entertaining viewers and uh, looking good, hopefully, and uh, aligning and moving apart from one another, uh, the elements are actually turning something that would generate power from the wind. And, you know, that was something in my head that I always thought, I mean, literally for 20, 30 years that I thought that could be possible, but I never really put it to a practice. I don't know. Anybody else? John, you do. You keep talking about your your work being almost a very um, mimicking nature and how yeah, that and moves. So, I mean, obviously, of influence from nature. Where do you think you can well, I think drive when, that moving forward? When you look at at how these <laughs> technologies move back into the culture, when when they're starting up, they're fascinating in themselves, and so we're dealing with something new, and we we create a, a kind of a new language around the use of this device, but in the end, uh, what's really happening is it turns back into an organic process. As, uh, as AI gets on the scene with us, it's going to simulate what we are. It, you're, it's not going to create something in terribly different. Uh, and so even in architecture, the, the complexity of buildings around the world right now, it's organic form that's reinvesting itself in our architecture. We finally got good enough that we can build things that a tree can build. And so I, st I still feel there's this great love of uh, this root feeling we have about the, the, the natural world is coming through all these wonders of engineering, and we're making a natural world out of this stuff again. So Wonderful. We've got a place in this. Nice. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so this is a... a question I know you all will want to answer. <laughs> what do people express to you when they experience your kinetic artworks? 
I, I love these responses, but you want to start, Meryl? The one question I always get is, where is the motor? Okay. Always. It's just a constant, constant question. And, and of course, there's no motor. It's just the wind. Well, I often get, why is it so expensive? <laughs> <laughs> and if you make it a foot shorter, can I save some money? <laughs> And I think, I think the amount of energy that goes into making one of these things is incredible. And the amount of experimentation and frustration and trial and error and you spend two months making something and assemble it and then realize, no, that doesn't work. Um, so it's, it, is, it is tough. It's, it's a challenging hobby. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, uh, the thing that people remark on most when they uh, look at my work is that, you know, it's, it's uh, meditative and contemplative and uh, calming. And, you know, that's, that's probably the aspect of my work that uh, interests me most to uh, present to the public. It's also, uh, you know, as hinted at earlier on, one of the things that kinetic art does is it, it allows people to um, access um, art in a way that sometimes can be a little difficult. Um, because of the motion and things like that, it, it's, it brings attention for long enough that uh, people can get a picture of what's going on. I, I get often asked, uh, how long did it take you to make that sculpture? Which I don't know if any here probably all agree that you don't really start a piece and just keep working on it till it's over. I never have kept track of my hours on it in one particular sculpture. And then the other one that they ask me an awful lot is, um, is that a clock? And uh, which I, I, or how does that work? I say magic. Is that a clock? Is, I, I answer, uh, yes, it's a, a brand new metric clock. It's a hundred hour clock. And right now it's, uh, <laughs> 20, uh, the hour is 20.25.03. Uh, <laughs> and so, no, I, I joke around with that a lot, these questions. Mm -hmm. Questions. Oh, yeah. Um, people are often appreciating the, the artwork on a, on a simpler level than what's buzzing around in my head. And so you get things like, cool. That's, that's it. <laughs> and, and yet, I feel like the, the information's coming across anyway, but, and, and we're out there, we'll be out there in the rain today talking to people, and we're, we're intellectualizing about what this stuff's about. You're feeling it in here, you know, as you stand in front of the art, and that, that's the actual communication. If you get a chance to be around a piece like his long enough, you pick up all this internal awareness, which is, it's hard to bring it back to your brain almost, but that's the real uh, language of what's going on out there as we walk around, I think. Would you like to answer, <laughs> Dale? Next question. Okay, next question. <laughs> um, I want you to go around and each of you just talk a little bit about where your art is installed, um, you know, some of the type of work that you're doing in other parts of the country or the world. I can go first. Uh, I have uh, uh, pieces in uh, California, Fontana at a park, uh, permanently installed. Uh, that particular uh, piece that's installed there was uh, went through Wilma and Katrina, both at 140 mile an hour sustained winds in downtown Fort Lauderdale at the uh, Broward County Courthouse. One, that's one sculpture. I have lots of others. Another one that I'd like to mention would be a piece of uh, at the Hot Springs, Arkansas uh, Convention Center with 70-foot ceilings, and uh, it's a hanging mobile. Uh, I do a lot more than outdoor work. And, and then another one that's just kind of a new piece that's never, I've never created before up until just this last uh, January is a private commission, which is a, one of my bird uh, pieces that was, uh, somebody asked if I could do that as a hanging mobile, which I did, and it works. 
It's just three birds that uh, sort of turn and kind of rock, and it, it really worked out beautiful. So that's just three of many. Well, um, my current project is for Port Everglades, Florida, and uh, hopefully if everything goes well, it'll be installed in August. Um, it's four butterflies on crescent shapes, and uh, the tallest one is about 14 feet high, then the next one would be 12 feet high, uh, going down to about eight feet and six feet. And uh, they're all kinetic, uh, a little bit bigger than the one here at the Arboretum. And uh, I'm in public and private commissions around the world, and I never believed that I'd be making insects at age 50. Mm. My largest indoor commission is at the Music Center at Strathmore in North Bethesda, Maryland. I utilized large prisms suspended like mobiles off of aluminum arcs, 96 feet spanning across the opening, four stories high, and uh, it moves because of openings uh, at the ground floor as well as above from the main entrance of the concert hall. This is the home of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, one of their second homes. My largest outdoor commission is at the entrance of the Long Island Children's Museum. It's called Wind Dancing. It has uh, independent arcs with rotational bird-like forms rotating in multiple directions around the central spiral. Uh, finally, I'd like to mention Getting There, which is owned by Dr. Watson uh, of Watson and Crick, DNA fame. This is a piece similar to Sisyphus. It's an infinity symbol that's on his grounds at Cold Spring Harbor, the International Science Laboratory on Long Island. Makes it that much more special to make it. And we have one in the city of Boynton Beach, a permanent installation. Oh, Boynton Beach, another one? You forgot. <laughs> I, 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 most of my pieces are in, in uh, the United States, but I, I do have a fair amount of things in, you know, uh, well, uh, Korea, Australia, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, uh, and not all of them are large pieces. Uh, last year I did three uh, significant pieces, one for Stanford University, one for uh, San Luis Obispo, uh, and one for a private client, which is probably the most complex piece that I did uh, last year. And it's in the middle of a saltwater swimming pool, which is really interesting. Um, I, I went with ceramic bearings on that one. Uh, salt water, you do not want to have stainless steel uh, around because uh, you'll be replacing bearings frequently. Um, did I answer that question? You're, you're continuing to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember every piece. I'm sorry. I'm 72 now, so you know. <laughs> well, where, where your work? Where is it? And at, you know, you're talking about your work around the world and oh, locations. Oh well. Uh, Were you done? That's fine. Yeah, he pretty much said it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it I didn't want to say too much. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have three more large pieces that I'm doing this year, and that's uh, probably all I'm only going to do for, for this year. And uh, two will be in San Diego, one with uh, my, my better half, Diane Sebeck, uh, who is, uh, uh, will be putting glass, dichroic glass, in one of my kinetic pieces. And so it's very, very much a collaboration, and I think that's, uh, that, that's really an exciting, uh, uh, probably the most exciting thing I'll do this year. Love you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my uh, big work, big public work, is mostly in the Midwest, uh, particularly Illinois. Um, I've done a number of commissions for uh, universities in Illinois. Um, my, biggest, my biggest piece to date is uh, a sculpture I made um, for a park in Memphis, which is right on the Mississippi River in a new park. Uh, and it was, it was quite large and very challenging. And um, 
I since have really kind of changed my focus back to uh, experimenting and particularly with sound. Uh, and so I'm hoping to really go in another direction and create um, works that are kind of um, sound temples. Uh, so a structure uh, that you can go into mm -hmm. and once you are in there, you discover uh, all sorts of sounds that are being created by things that are activated by the wind. Um, so I have some woodshed time ahead of me uh, <laughs> working that out. Wonderful. Um, Michigan, Colorado, recently Kansas, and <laughs> occasionally Florida. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, talking about, you know, the future of kinetic art, um, you know, what do you think is uh, some of the stuff you saw today in the presentations? What are your thoughts and comments about some of the new technologies or, you know, where kinetic art can take us in the future? I know you hit on some of it before, but you might want to. Well, you see this in, the, in some of the video footage. The one, one big area that is kind of huge public entertainment pieces, and these are not going to be durable, permanent, uh, things, but it's it's sort of the Burning Man connection and people having a, a really awesome experience in an urban area. So I think a lot of you're going to see a lot of temporary artworks that are set up just for a few months uh, and have a huge impact on people. Uh, and then uh, the other other side of it is people that have physical plant that's going to exist, and you're going to put things out there that need to stay there for 20 years, and and so the. Uh, these pieces are, are more rooted in their physicality and their, uh, their ability to endure the conditions and produce an experience as well. Sure. I am really hoping it will continue to be about wind and light. I believe that there is the trending and the timeless and that what is catching on right now might be a particular branding or a particular fad. And I'm hoping that there will be another wave that brings us back in the opposite direction and maybe it'll be a meeting between the two. I also believe that in the public realm where things are made to last for a while, I believe that there is an interest in visionary teams uh, global teams, and that's one thing I think technology can really accomplish, is creating the input from different people's uh, point of view, different locations geographically, to create a work that will endure. Right. Yeah, a few years ago, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited by Princeton University uh, for a project called Quark Park. And uh, what Quark Park was, was they took leading scientists from Princeton University and teamed them up with uh, artists like myself uh, in order to uh, create a, a, a work of art based on their technology. And uh, I was uh, teamed up with the uh, director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, um, who's working on a project called Stellarator. And the Stellarator is a project where, um, if they're successful, we'll have limitless energy without any hazardous byproducts. The byproduct was helium, and uh, we have a shortage of that on Earth. So what I did was I built uh, a Stellarator machine using, uh, you know, just prefabricated um, quick fabrication uh, tubes, and uh, the the Stellarator thing was carved out of styrofoam. I hung a live Jupiter tree uh, in the center of it to uh, represent the electron flow, um, and it was inverted. It was irrigated and totally living, and uh, 
on top of my solar panels. And uh, so th I think that these kind of partnerships um, can drive, um, we had neurological um, sculptures that, that used uh, LED lights that were programmed and, and, and that thing. But my, my, my personal feeling is that um, kinetic art um, in the future would probably be more robotic um, and assembling, that's just sort of my sense that I'm getting. Okay, anybody else? Yes, no? Um, you wanna? I, I, I think maybe a holography is, is going to present a whole, a whole new field and, and is already, and I think it's a, you know, very dynamic because it has the least material involved, maybe the most technology. But um, uh, the, 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 the reduced material of kinetic art, I think, is one of its most significant aspects. I mean, I started carving granite, and uh, it was too heavy. And, uh, and I mm. did steel, and steel was too heavy. And now I use titanium, it's too heavy. But the, uh, you know, the concept, the motion, and also I think that uh, holography will add another component that, uh, that typically kinetic work doesn't have, and that's a narrative component. Um, uh, and I think it's also one of the reasons that uh, kinetic work has lagged behind in terms of um, uh, the ability for artists, or not artists, but uh, uh, people to talk about the art. Is that narrative often uh, offers, you know, you can take a string um, and, a, and, a, and a, good, uh, a good writer will uh, make it into a, uh, a novel. Uh, but it's very difficult to, to write about uh, kinetic art, except in a technical way. Anybody else? Well, you can write about it in a poetic way. It's <laughs> lyrical. There you go. So, um, I mean, now we looked at a lot of different art forms, you know, in kinetic, meaning op art and you know, uh, wind-driven solar, all these other technological advances. Um, what about the digital? I mean, there's a lot of controversy. Is digital kinetic or not? I mean, is that something you want to comment on? I think digital is a tool. Okay. Digital art. <clears throat> well, Yaakov Agam, he, I consider him to be a, um, a kinetic artist. Uh, Although it's the viewer who's moving, and you know he has the pleated pieces. I don't know if you get any of you are familiar, but you look at it from one angle, it looks one way. You look at it straight on, it has another appearance, and of course, from the other direction, uh, it it changes as well. They have one at the uh, Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, that it's actually uh, rotates. Uh, if any of you ever get up there. And I don't know, you know, it's not necessarily digital, but uh, it certainly is the cross between, I guess, a two-dimensional piece and a real kinetic piece. So, you know, I think they can be considered kinetic, but uh, I prefer wind and gravity. All right, so I guess if nobody else has anything else they would like to say, I'll open it for questions. Are you okay with that? Are you? Yes? Okay, thank you. Thank um, you very much.